If you're just joining us, for the past few weeks, we have been doing a series, Standing Firm, Living a Victorious Life. And today is the last part of that series. Stand firm. That's really the command that Paul gives us, to be able to stand firm. And as believers, we have to acknowledge that we are in a battle. Yes, it often looks like maybe a human flesh and blood battle, but it's not that. It is a spiritual battle. And I've given you numerous examples through the past couple of weeks to highlight that, not only on a worldwide level, on a national level, on a church level, on an individual level, to help you understand the battle that we are in. And Paul says that we are to wear our armor to be able to stand firm in that battle. So if you've been here, yes, I know you also have your sermon notes, you can help, but we're going to check it out. What was the first thing you had to put on? The belt of what? The belt of truth. Not just a belt, but the belt of truth, because it is on that that all the armor goes. I know you didn't expect a quiz, but here you go. On top of that belt then goes the breastplate of righteousness. And whose righteousness is it? Christ Jesus. It is his righteousness that we wear. And then you got to put something on your feet. And what did you put on your feet? Shoes for the gospel of peace. So we are always there in the gospel with peace. And then what happens if you bump your head, right? Actually, I'm sorry, I skipped that. I went one. You've got to do something with flaming darts. The shield of faith. And it's not your faith, but it is the object of your faith, which is Jesus and his word. And then you have to put on the helmet of salvation. And finally, you have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And how many people brought your Bibles? Couple more. Good. Bring your Bibles, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the word of God. We must have our word of God with us. So now, that's the whole armor of God. But Paul says something else. He says, what's important, what's necessary for you with that armor is prayer. Prayer is what actually makes the armor work. So if you think about it, prayer is a necessity. It sustains us and empowers us to, put on, to take up and put on the full armor of God. Prayer is a necessity. Let me give you an example. Let's say you've got a nice car. Nice car. It's brand new, right? It's got brand new wheels on it. The engine's clean. It's got the shiny buff on it. Inside, you've got all the electronics that work really well. But what really makes the car start? It's the battery, right? You can have a beautiful car, and if you try to turn the key with a dead battery, the car is dead, right? The car's dead. You have to have, make sure that the battery is charged, and the battery, when it runs in a car, has to be connected to, okay, here's the automotive part. What does it need to be connected to? Alternator. Very good. All right. Alternator, because it's the alternator that charges it, right? Well, listen, you and I as Christians, we expend a lot of spiritual energy in our ministry. You and I must be connected to the source of power. And the only way we are connected to the source of power, which is God himself, is through prayer. So prayer is a necessity in this regard. Martin Luther said this, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Paul says in our reading today, he says that we should be praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Now, I don't know if you noticed, there are a couple words that are repeated in there. 
And the words that repeated really is all. There are four alls in there. So today, we are going to take a look at that all, praying with our all in all, so to speak, because it is a spiritual battle. Prayer is what connects you to God. Prayer is what empowers you to be able to even put on the armor of God. William Cowper, who was a English poet and, hymn, and wrote hymns, says, Satan trembles when he sees the least of his saints on the knees. Satan trembles when he sees the least of saints on his knees. So today we're going to take a look at what makes Satan tremble. And not only tremble, but empowers us to stand firm. We're going to take a look at four, the four alls, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication, with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So the first one we're going to take a look at is, skipped, there we go, praying at all times in the spirit. This one to me is daunting. I don't know about you. I can't do anything all day long. I can't even do some things for hours at a time, sometimes even five minutes at a time. It's like, oh, it's nice outside. You know, you have that in the morning? It's difficult to pray. And yet, Paul in another place said that we are to pray without ceasing. So how are we to pray at all times? Well, who should be our example of praying? It's Jesus. Jesus is our example of how to pray. So we see Jesus praying at the beginning of the day, in the middle of the day, at the end of the day. He prays before he speaks, before he heals. He prays afterwards as well. He prays for him to be in the Father's will, that he is walking as the Father would have him walk. He prays in the garden. There's not a time in his life when he's not in communication with the Father. He was never out. So couldn't you actually say Jesus was always praying? I mean, wouldn't we take a look at his life and say Jesus was always praying? And I think that's the sense that Paul gives here, especially when it comes to spiritual battle. We are to pray at all occasions and in every season. We are to pray at every occasion and in every season. When you come and begin your day, begin it with prayer. In the middle of the day, thank God. At the end of the day, end in prayer. When you begin a ministry effort, you begin with prayer. And you pray throughout. And then you pray at the end. When there's a spiritual battle, you don't just pray at the very end, saying, Lord God, I really got beat up there. Could you help me out now? No, you pray in the beginning of that. You pray before you go into the fray, you pray in the middle of it, and you pray at the end. Pray on every occasion and in every season. Now, as the second part, we are to pray in the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, to pray in the Spirit does not mean some sort of mystical experience. It does not mean some sort of trance. It does not mean, as some of the charismatics and other brothers and sisters in Christ might say, that you must speak in tongues. To pray in the Spirit does not mean you have to speak in tongues. As a matter of fact, tongues is a very specific gift, and Paul said not everybody has that gift. But that's another conversation. To pray in the Spirit is really asking the Holy Spirit to guide us in our prayers. It is this, to pray is to, in the Spirit is to seek God's guidance. That's it. See, the thing is, a lot of people don't pray to seek God's guidance. A lot of people seek God's benefits, but not his guidance. And they use prayers like quarters in a slot machine. And they think, if I put enough prayer quarters in there, I'll finally pull the lever and win. 
But that's not it. We should be able to pray for God's guidance. So something like this. Ask for the Holy Spirit to be with you in prayer. To let you be able to voice what is needed. And as you pray, ask the Holy Spirit to conform your will to God's will, not God's will to your will. You understand the difference between those two things? This is what it means to be able to pray in the Spirit. John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, he said, prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate, outpouring of the heart or soul to God through Christ Jesus in the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit for such things as God has promised according to the word of God for the good of the church with submission in faith to the will of God. I like that quote. I think it's a good quote and helps us ground what it means to be able to pray in the spirit. Yet admittedly, there are times And I I know, I go through them, everybody goes through them, where we're so bumped and bruised, we don't even know what to pray. I mean, all we can kind of just sit there, maybe at that time, at that moment, at the end of the day, when things seem really dark, and all we can do is groan, so to speak. And in that case, it says from Romans chapter 8, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And then going on in verse 27, he says, And he who searches the heart knows what is in the mind and the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Pray every occasion, every season. And also pray with all prayer and supplication. Prayer and supplication. How many of you use the word supplication normally in just everyday language? No, it's like, it's one of those words, right? We kind of know what prayer means. And in this regard, Paul uses prayer as a general word for prayer. So it could be a praising of God. It could be thanking God. Supplication is different. It is much more specific. Supplication is a prayer asking for specific needs or for God to intercede on behalf, on or on behalf, sorry, or for God to intercede on our behalf or on the behalf of someone else. So prayer, supplication, is a very specific need that you're asking for, either for yourself or for others. So Jesus gave us a perfect example of prayer and supplication. We did a series of, on it when we first came here. We've been doing it in our uh, adult education hour. We did, do it, did it in confirmation. We're also, I think, also Matthew, Gospel of Matthew Bible study. So we've been covering it a lot. Anybody know what the example is? It's the Lord's Prayer. It's the Lord's prayer. He gave us a wonderful example of prayer and supplication. From Matthew chapter 6, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard by their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's a beautiful prayer. It's a profound prayer. In this particular prayer, he starts off with a caution first, doesn't he? He first gives a warning about praying without the Spirit. And if you pray without the Spirit, what is that? What does he call it? He calls it empty babbling. So it's just babbling. He says, don't do that. 
Listen, God is not impressed with your eloquence, nor is he concerned with your lack of eloquence. He is not impressed with your rhetorical style or how many words you use or how often you use his name in your prayer. He is not impressed with that. There's a quote here that I really like. It's from John Moreland. He says, prayer is not an artful monologue, a voice lifted up from the sod. It is love's tender dialogue between the soul and God. Isn't that beautiful? Prayer is not an artful monologue of voice lifted up from the sod. It is love's tender dialogue between the soul and God. This is coming before the Lord in the spirit. And here's what Jesus does in that prayer. What does he do? He starts off praising God. He gives praise, hallowed be your name. He lifts up God, his holiness, and his name. See, his prayer first is grounded in who God is. And then he says, it's your will. Your will be done. I want to know your will more, and I want to live your will. And then what does he do? And here's where the supplications come in. He says, Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Deliver us from evil. Those are very specific, three specific supplications within the Lord's prayer. See, if you take a look at biblical prayer, you often find that it follows a pattern. It follows a pattern. And the pattern pretty much is this, that there is praise, repentance, giving thanks, and asking. There's actually a different acronym that can go with it, but I remembered that nobody remembers the acronym, so I don't even try that anymore. But you can get that, right? You start with praise. Praise, tell God how much you appreciate who he is. Express your love for him. Praise be to God, Psalm 68. How awesome are your deeds, Psalm 66. Repent. A lot of our prayers aren't as powerful because we don't repent. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's repentance that goes with this, right? Giving thanks. Psalm 69, glorifying him with thanksgiving. Sometimes, maybe, maybe you should just take one prayer of thanksgiving, period. Just spend a couple minutes thanking God, nothing else. No other supplications, just thanking him. And then finally, finally, there's asking. This is your supplications, if you will. Philippians 4, 6 says, make your request known to God. Tell God, no matter how big, no matter how small, ask. By the way, if you're interested, and if you got your Bibles or you want to note it later, Daniel chapter 9, 1 through 19 is a great example of following, in essence, this pattern. Daniel chapter 9. And take a look, by the way, at how much he spends on repentance, on contrition, if you will. There's a lot he spends on it first. So we have praying at all times, all prayer and supplication, and now we have with all perseverance. So I mentioned last week, if you were here, perseverance is a hallmark of living a victorious life, living a victorious Christian life. Jesus himself said from our reading, but stay awake at all times. And then what did he say? say? He says, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. That persistence, the tenacity of prayer is so important. How many of you have ever gone grocery shopping with a three-year-old? Or maybe put it this way, how many of you have gone shopping with a three-year-old and survived? They are tenacious, aren't they? And here's how it goes. If you go grocery shopping with a three-year-old, we're going to go grocery shopping. And you may not ask for a chocolate chip cookie. You're not going to get one. 
Okay? And so, and you're in the cart, right? And going okay so far, but then the closer you get to the cookie aisle, what does the kid do? I want a cookie, I want a cookie. Starts grabbing for it, I want a cookie, I want a... And you say, what did I say? No chocolate chip cookies. And then finally you get through the cookie aisle, through the valley of death, <laughs> right? You're there. You turn the corner. It's better now. But then you realize you made a fatal error and had to go back in the cookie aisle for something. And then the child, of course, then increases ever more. I want a cookie. I want a cookie. I want a cookie. And here's what you do. You take the cookies and you look very sternly and say, don't tell your mother. Right? That's the tenacity of a three-year-old with cookies. And in part, that three-year-old is, although not honoring your mother and father, but being biblical in respects to asking and the perseverance of asking. Here's what Jesus said, Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 7. Jesus said, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared nor rejected, respected man. And there was a widow in the city who kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversaries. For a while he refused, but afterwards he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Jesus said, hear what the unrighteous judge says? And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? You see, we can actually take a lesson from Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. And he said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Do you see the rising level of engagement, of action within that particular verse? And actually, if you take a look it, in the original language, it would say, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. So there's a perseverance Within all of that, this is a picture of a man who simply will not give up. This is kind of the perseverance we're talking about here, which is not giving up in prayer. Because we often do want to give up. There was a pastor uh, who had an experience. They had a baptism in their church, and afterwards, in uh, one of the stairwells, he came across one of the members, a woman, who was crying, she was sobbing. And uh, he asked her, well, why are you sobbing? Because it had been a very joyful time of worship. And uh, she said, I'm struggling. You see, it was my mom who was baptized today. I prayed for her almost every day for 20 years. And the reason I'm crying is because I came this close to giving up on her. At the five-year mark, I said, who needs this? God isn't listening. At the 10-year mark, I said, why am I wasting my breath? At the 15-year mark, I said, this is absurd. At the 19 mark, I said, I'm just a fool. But I just kept trying, praying. Even with weak faith, I kept praying. Then she received Christ and was baptized today. I will never doubt again the power of prayer. Pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication, all perseverance, and now making supplication for all the saints. The verse is making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opportun opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to to speak. So Charles Spurgeon, he was one of the greatest preachers in England, lived in the 1800s. He was called the Prince of Preachers. 
And it has been recorded that he often spoke to groups, crowds of 10,000 or more. And his sermons still to this day, over 100 years later, provide great encouragement for many Christians, for many pastors. I myself will occasionally read one of his sermons to see what he had to say regarding a particular topic. Yet he wouldn't take credit for his success, that it was his preaching that was his success. You see, if he, people came to his church and they said, what are you doing? What makes your church so explosive, so wonderful? And you know what he would do? He would take them down to the basement and he would open up the door to one of the rooms and inside that room, it was full of people praying. He said, that is the secret to our success. He said, the church basement prayer room was the furnace room. It is the powerhouse of the church. As a matter of fact, the prayer meeting was the meeting he most looked forward to the entire week. So here's a question. Can we be a furnace room. I'm serious. Can we at Joy be a furnace room? Not just as something we do on a Sunday, but there is a power where we come together, coming on our knees before the Lord. That's what we need to be. We have opportunities. We have challenges. Can we be that? You see, Fervency of prayer is not simply for our own sake, but also for the sake of others. Praying is vital to standing firm. We pray not only for ourselves, we pray for the church. We pray for people in Fountain Hills that they might come here, that they might be encouraged, that they might grow alive, deep and bold in the love and knowledge of Jesus. That's what we pray for. We pray for an aliveness to be a beacon on the hill. Can we do that? And I say we must. We must. Prayer is not just this thing, it is a necessity. And Paul, you would think Paul, you would think Paul, who is this icon of evangelism, of faith, everything that he wrote, everything that he preached, that he wouldn't need prayer, would he? But yet he asks for the prayer so that he might be bold. Because here's the thing. When you are standing firm in the gospel, you have more spiritual tax, not less. And thus, we all need that prayer to be able to stand firm. We are to pray at all times in the spirit all prayer and supplication with all perseverance and, and all supplication for the saints. I don't think I need to do a call for action. I normally do it at the end of a message, but I think you've heard this all the way through. So let's bow our heads and come to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we praise you and we thank you. We thank you for the great love you have for us. We thank you that in you we are redeemed, we are saved, we have a new life. We do repent of the sins in our lives that are not in your keeping, that keep us from you. And we thank you that you do forgive sins. And let us be washed and renewed every day by your word and by your grace and your mercy. And we pray that we have a spirit of prayer, a fervency of prayer, that we come together as a body in Christ, in you, to lift up our voices to you, to be guided by you and strengthened by you. We pray that we may do this so that we may stand firm in you and you alone. In your name we pray, amen. We hope that you've been blessed by this message. 
If you have any questions or you would like to grow deeper in your faith, please visit our website at joyccc.com. Again, that's joyccc.com. God's peace and joy in Christ Jesus be with you.